I know this time of year can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, uh, some awesome, some very not awesome, but I'd like to invite all of us, regardless of the attitude we might normally approach Christmas with, let's focus on Jesus, let's take a couple weeks and remind ourselves that even if this is a bad season for us this year, imagine what it would be if Jesus hadn't been here and not given us the reason to be celebrating this. So uh, I encourage you, I don't want to make light of any troubles you are having, but I encourage you even in the middle of that, join the people that are rejoicing and say, I'm setting my face toward Jesus. I'm going to stay positive because the Holy Spirit's been in me, uh, and it's always better with Him. So we're going to push forward in that direction and uh, spend a couple of weeks just celebrating this time and what it means that Jesus is here with us. Father, thank you for sending your Son uh, to become a human being, uh, to be one of us, so that He could do for us what we can't do for ourselves, to, to bring us freedom and life, to pay for our sin, uh, to die in our place. And Lord, we're just so grateful for that, uh, that it didn't stop there, but that he rose again and he's seated at your right hand and the Holy Spirit's with us today. And it just all of that is wrapped up in this time that, that we celebrate at Christmas time, the goodness of our God to draw near to us. And, and so we just celebrate that today. We say thank you, Lord. Amen.
mindful of us what do you see it's worth looking our way Jesus we are free in a ways that we never should be sweet release from the grip of his chains I can just
more time. Let's just let your heart sing. My heart sings a brand new song. The debt is paid. These chains are gone. And then you wear God with us. Yeah. My debt is paid. Set us paid. Set us paid. Set us
all things rise. All things bless in the name of Jesus. Father, we can't wait for that day. All things made right and new again. You started that process. You started that work. You're doing that work in us today, Lord. All things made right and new again. You give life, God. You give hope. You give joy. You give peace where we would have none.
Jesus. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, God. over us. Darkness reigns no more for Jesus is great.
that bridge with me one more time. Now behold. Now behold your glory. Glory and the highest. All the earth rejoice for Christ is born. God, I set my heart to rejoice in your presence. Now behold your glory. We rejoice at your coming, God. We rejoice at your presence. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us today. Fill us, oh God, with your spirit, your presence. Wash over us, cleanse us, renew us, refresh us, restore us. Inspire us, lead us, guide us. Father, we we rejoice at your nearness to us. We rejoice at your coming. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to the vineyard. Woo! Finally winter time. Got out my winter clothes. Speaking of which, tonight is our Christmas party. Now this year, woo! This year it's going to be on Zoom, but since we, we will still be able to see our top half, it means you can wear your Christmas sweaters today. Pants off. They say it's off. Also, uh, we are still having our Christmas Eve party in the building, so be mindful of that. That one, if you want to be on, on Zoom, you still want to watch it over that way, it's perfect. If you want to be in person, you want to still make sure you are here. Outside these doors, you guys have may have seen a crate of steadily dwindling malt balls. If you would like one, or would like to bring one to a friend, go ahead and grab one on your way out. They are there for you to grab. Also, we'll say... Daniel, Pastor, uh, Kathy, any one of those, we are, we are getting those ready for those families, the family promise, and preparing the meals and giving them gifts. And it's like, I really want to get involved in that. I know the time is running short, so uh, please ask about that today. So go ahead and do that. Next Sunday? Do next Sunday. So, very soon. Again, if you have more questions, you can ask Nathaniel after service. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and pray for offering. God, thank you for blessing us so much, giving us the greatest gift of all and showing us what truly matters. Help us to do that meaningful with what we've been given to you and what it's given to us. Help us to be the people that that blessing is given to us. <laughs> came to see Mary. She was doing laundry, and then the angel just appeared, and she was really scared. So Gabriel was like, Mary, you're going to have, what? I can't, I can't say it good. Mary, you're going to have a baby. I, you're going to have a baby, and you will call him Jesus. And then Mary was like, I'm not going to have a baby yet. I'm only a teenager. I'm not married. Then the angel Gabriel told Joseph that Mary is not lying. She, you are having a new baby. And so they met up. They went to Bethlehem, which was Joseph's old town. They ride a donkey. <laughs> I don't know. A camel. Oh, yeah, a camel. She said, this donkey's fast. Well, they tried to go to a hotel, and they asked the keeper um, for a place to stay. The keeper said, we have no rooms, literally no rooms. <laughs> so Mary and Joseph walked away sadly, but then he said, the only place in here in Bethlehem hand that, that you can stay, stay is a staple. And then he just pointed the way and they followed. <laughs> When the shepherds were taking care of the sheep, then they saw angels. The angel said, a new baby is getting born, who is king of the Jews. The angel was singing. Gloria 
us. And then the shepherd said, I think we should go there and meet him. The second, I think, said, yeah, I agree with you. And the other said, yeah, me too. They had to walk through a bunch of grass and bushes, maybe have to camp out a night. And then the wise men heard about it. And then a star appeared. We should probably follow that star. It's pointing down to the barn. So maybe we should follow it. Maybe. So the wise men went to Jesus. They gave them gifts. A stuffed animal, like a hippo one, to have at home. Some diapers, and <laughs> some wipes, and some milk, <laughs> some shoes, some Jordans. Gold, Frank, and Latimer. And I don't know how I would survive in that barn. Too stinky, too crowded, and ugh. I think he probably pooped <laughs> because the room was very smelly. Thank you for coming. He's adorable. He's going to be our best friend. I love you, and you're the best baby i ever seen. There, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> the new baby is going to change the world. I decided to do a couple messages on Christmas carols this Christmas. As you can see in your outline, the Christmas carol for this week is Away in a Manger. And as a little background, this song was first published in a Lutheran Sunday school curriculum in 1885, and nobody knows who wrote the lyrics. Some people claim that it was Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, but most historians say there's no evidence at all to show that he wrote it. And so there's a mystery as to who wrote the lyrics. But it's no mystery at all that this has been one of the most loved Christmas carols for decades and decades. There's something about imagining Jesus being born as a baby, God stripping himself of his glory and being born in the lowest place. And by doing that, God shows that no matter how low or humble or weak we may be, we can still receive his grace. There's a phrase that's used over and over again in this song that I want to focus on. The little Lord Jesus. It's repeated several times. Away in a manger, no room for a bed. The little Lord Jesus. Now, here's a question for you. What is the most important word in that phrase? The little Lord Jesus. Obviously, it's not the, so there's really three words to choose from. The most important word is not little. Because Jesus didn't stay a six-pound, eight-ounce baby in a manger, uh, obviously. uh, And and so that's not the most important. The most important word is not even Jesus. Because God could have told Mary and Joseph to name his son something else, and, and it wouldn't have taken away from his importance at all. And so the most important word by far is the word Lord. The little Lord Jesus. That one word makes all the difference in the world. And so this morning, rather than focusing on the size of the baby, what I want to do is focus on the fact that this baby was Lord. 740 times in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as Lord. In fact, the very first mention of his birth, we see him called Lord. In Luke chapter 2, the shepherds are watching flocks at night. An angel appears and says, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there's been born for you a Savior. And then the angel said, Who is Christ the what? Christ the Lord. So the very beginning of the story, we see that Jesus is the Savior of the world, and he is Lord. So the question for today is, what does that really mean to us today? If Jesus is Lord, what does that mean in our everyday life? You know, if we're married, what does it mean for our marriage? If we're dating, what does it mean in our dating relationship? If we're out shopping for Christmas presents or perhaps doing it on Amazon, what does that mean for us today that Jesus is Lord? And what does it mean for us to make Jesus our Lord? Excuse me. Most of you know that the New Testament is translated from Greek. And the original Greek word that we see uh, translated as Lord is the word kurios. 
Anybody curious what kurios means? Uh, this word kurios means the supreme authority, the king, the ultimate controller. Now, I can imagine for some of us that, you know, the, the word ultimate controller might not be a positive image for us. Because if Jesus is the controller, that means that I'm not, right? It means that you don't get to control your own life. And that's the problem because all of us want to be in control, right? Thankfully, I don't have a problem with that at all. I, I don't have a problem with being a controlling person. As long as everything goes my way and, and everybody does what I want, I don't have a problem with that at all. Oh, okay, maybe I do have a little problem. I want to be in control just like all of us do, right? We all want to control things in our lives. Whether it's, you know, I just want my day to go a certain way, or I want people around me to act like I think they should, or I want my kids to do what I say, or I want my, you know, husband to do the chores without me having to remind them, or I want my wife to, you know, leave me alone when I'm watching the game, or, or you know, whatever it might be. I, I want my Christmas just to go perfect. The kids will come down, their hair will be combed, and, you know, the, nobody will be fighting with each other. Everybody's going to, you know, sing carols together and we'll read Luke chapter 2 the angels will be singing you know and, and everybody will be completely connected with their presence right and if it doesn't go the way that I had hoped and planned then I'm ticked right because I want to be in control but of course the reality is that we're not no matter how hard you try you're not really in control of very much at all are you Jesus, though, is the supreme authority, the ultimate controller. Jesus is Lord. And so, what does that mean when we make Jesus our Lord? Well, technically, we don't make Jesus Lord. A lot of us use that phrase, but it's not very accurate. God is the one who made Jesus Lord a long, long time ago. He is already Lord, so we don't make him Lord. What we do is we surrender to what already is. We surrender our lives to his lordship. We surrender to his supreme authority. We surrender to the only one who is really in control. We surrender to the Lord. And so there's a couple questions. Well, first, why would I do that? And second, how do I do that? So let's talk about the first one, and let me use an illustration. Imagine you have two women, same age, same educational level, both from average income families, similar backgrounds, and you hire both of them. And you say, you're going to be working on an assembly line, working for minimum wage, and I want you to take part A and put it into slot B and then hand it off to the next person on the line, and you're going to do that over and over and over and over again eight hours a day, day in, day out, for the next year. And so they go to work, and it is really boring work. Same simple task over and over and over, do, both doing the same exact thing. In fact, there's only one difference. You tell the first woman that at the end of the year, you're going to give her a bonus of $1,000. She says, okay, fine. And you tell the second woman that at the end of the year, you're going to give her a bonus of $100 million. After a couple of weeks of work, the first woman will be saying, you know, isn't this boring? I mean, this is driving me out of my mind. It's so, you know, it's same every day. You know, aren't, aren't, aren't you thinking about quitting? And the second woman says, are you crazy? This is the best opportunity I have ever had. I am so blessed to even have this job. I can't believe I was chosen for it. I'm singing and whistling while I'm working because I'm so happy. What is going on? Same job for both women experiencing this, the same circumstances, but with radically different attitudes, right? What makes the difference? Their expectation of the future. That's what makes the difference. One of them understands she is going to be wealthy beyond her wildest dreams if she just puts up with this situation for a little while. And that makes her present circumstances well, well worth it. 
And in fact, she's thrilled that she gets to put up with it because she's got in mind that future reward. You see, what we believe about our future completely controls how we experience our present. If we truly understand what God has given us in Christ Jesus, if we understand the amazing inheritance that we're going to receive, the eternal life and the joy and the blessings that God has in store for us, if we truly understand that, then there is no problem with us being willing to surrender our lives, everything we are and everything we have, to him. And we will do it with a joyful and exuberant attitude because we know the blessings that are to come. And that's why we're willing to surrender. Now, this next question becomes, well, how do we do that? And I want to talk about two different levels of surrender. The first level of surrender is what I would call the partially surrendered life. The partially surrendered life. And I'm afraid that this is where the vast majority of American Christians are at. America has so many of what I would call casual Christians or cultural Christians. They believe in God, but that belief makes little practical difference in their daily lives. It's the partially surrendered life. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus was talking about the wise builders and the foolish builders. And when he gets to talking to the foolish builders, he says this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Jesus says, why are you giving me lip service? I don't want lip service. I want life service. Don't just talk the talk. You need to walk the walk. Why is it you're calling me Lord, and then you do whatever the heck you want to do? Jesus is saying, this is not a game of let's pretend that Jesus is Lord. No, he says, I want you to do it. And yet today, there's so many people who would say, well, I believe that Jesus is my Lord, but I still want to be in control. You know, I, I believe Jesus is Lord, but I still want to do what I want to do. I believe Jesus is Lord, but, but I'm, I'm not going to trust him with everything. And, and so when it comes to my relationships, I know that Jesus says I'm supposed to pray for those who hurt me and, and you know, bless my enemies. And I know I'm supposed to forgive, but you don't know about how bad that person hurt me. You know, I, I can't forgive them. That's ridiculous. No way. Forget that. And I know that when it comes to my money, I'm supposed to trust God and not go crazy and dead. And I know I'm supposed to give 10%, but, you know, I'm on a tight budget. You know, that's an awful lot. I, I can't do that. And I know that when it comes to my time, I'm supposed to give God my time. I'm supposed to take a Sabbath every week and use my time to serve God and to serve others. But, I mean, my job is keeping me awfully busy. And, you know, I just barely have time to get to church. I can't do that. Jesus said, don't call me Lord. And then go do whatever it is you want to do. That is the partially surrendered life. You see, here's the deal. Jesus is not a part-time Lord. And he doesn't want part-time followers. When you come to him, he asks you to give your whole life. He says, you want to follow me? Then take up your cross and follow me. In other words, die to the things from your past. And he says, if you want to find your life, you lose it. You give it away. You surrender it. You come under the lordship of Christ. He is the supreme authority. He's the one who says what's right. He's the one who says what's wrong. He is the one who's the controller, the lord of it all. And we come under his lordship. It's not a pick and choose deal where I say, you know, I like the part about you keeping me out of hell and, and let me into heaven. You know, I like that part. But until I get to that time, I, I just want to kind of do what I want. And, and God, I'm sure you won't mind if I do that, right? Because I believe you're Lord. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to understand, Jesus is really serious when he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So here's what I'd like you to do just for a moment this morning, is to be open to what God might have to say to you right now and ask this question very prayerfully. Ask this, during this Christmas season, what is an area that I can surrender to God that I've been trying to control myself? 
What's an area that I haven't surrendered to the Lord, that I've been unwilling, I've been trying to control it myself? What is one area that God would want me to surrender to him? For some of you, it might be, you know, I'm going to trust God with my kids. You know, instead of constantly worrying about every detail of their lives and trying to control every detail, I'm just going to trust God with my kids. Or it could be my spouse. God, I'm going to surrender to you by loving my spouse no matter what. Even when they're not doing what I want, even when they're not doing what I think they should be doing, I'm still going to love them as surrender to you. Or it could be your future. Maybe you're trying to get it all lined up and planned out so it's got to go the way that I want it to go. You know, I'm going to go to the school here and get this job and I'm going to get married by such and such age and then we're going to retire in this place and and I want to plan it all out and God, your job is to just bless my plan because that's what I want. Or it could be a relationship. So what if I'm dating the wrong person and he's not drawing me closer to God? You know, I I like him. I I think I could change him. And so, you know, forget what God says about that. Or maybe it's some other area for you. Ask yourself, what area is it that I have not surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? You see, Jesus is not a part-time Lord. And he doesn't want part-time followers. Let's talk about another level of surrender. If you're taking notes, this is on your outline. The fully surrendered life. Not partially, the fully surrendered life. Surrendered to the Lord, the kurios, king, the creator. Fully surrendered, as in all in, not half-hearted, not kind of a Sunday Christian or a when it's convenient Christian or a God bless America Christian, but a full-on holding nothing back My life does not belong to me, but belongs to him, that kind of commitment. In fact, I love the way Paul talks about this in Romans 14, 7. He says, for we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, now let me stop and ask a question. How many of you this morning are alive? How many say, yeah, yeah, I'm living this morning. Wow, about two-thirds of you. That, that's pretty good. That's better than the last service. Uh, you know, and, and for those of you who aren't alive, um, we have uh, prayer time afterwards so we can do a resurrection. <laughs> but uh, Paul says, if we live, why do we live? It is to honor who? The Lord. The kurios, the supreme authority, the ultimate controller. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And then he goes on, and if we die... It's also to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. He makes it crystal clear. We belong to him. Our life does not belong to us anymore. We belong to him. We surrender to his lordship. We belong to him. It's a little bit like 37 years ago, I got an engagement ring and I gave it to Kathy. And uh, when I gave it to her, I said, will you wear, marry me? And, and I had it all planned out how it was going to go. You know, in my mind, it, it you know, was going to go like this. I looked deeper into her eyes, and I said, Kathy, will you bury me? And I was sure that she was going to be overwhelmed with joy, and, and she was going to immediately shout to the world, yes, yes, of course I'll marry you. You know, this is my dream come true. You know, that was my plan. It actually didn't work out that way. Uh, what actually happened was she was caught by surprise I hadn't really expected it and and she wasn't sure what she wanted to answer whether she should say yes or no and she had to think about it for a while Uh, fortunately she thought pretty quick and so it only took a minute or two and and then she said all right I I guess I'll marry you this was not like the huge affirmation that I was really planning on but at least she came up with the right answer And looking back, the important part was not how long she had to think about it. The important part was that I gave her a ring that night, and she accepted it. Now, question. How much did that ring cost her? It certainly cost me something, but, you know, how much did it cost her? Well, the answer is zero, right? Because I gave it to her. It was a free gift. I didn't say, yo, you give me 15 bucks, and I'll I'll give you this ring. No, I, I mean, I gave it to her, right? Uh, And so, as a free gift, it didn't cost her anything. But, when she decided to accept that ring, how much did that cost her? 
It cost her everything at that point because she committed to marry me. And 10 months later, as we stood before God and before a pastor at the um, San Diego North Island uh, Navy Chapel, and we said vows to each other, she gave her life to me and she promised to be with me always and to belong to me just like I belong to her. And so the ring didn't cost her anything to buy, but when she accepted it, it cost her everything because she gave her life to me just as I gave my life to her. Same thing with Jesus our Lord. When Jesus shed his blood on the cross for you, he offered you a free gift, salvation. And salvation is free. You cannot buy it. It is not by works so that no one can boast. It's a gift of God given to you. Salvation costs you nothing. But when you say yes to it, it costs you everything because you give your life away. You no longer have rights to your life from that point on. You belong to God. You surrender to his lordship. You are no longer the controller or the Lord of your life. Jesus is. You see, Jesus is not just the little Lord Jesus away in a manger. And he's not just the Lord Jesus on a cross dying for you. He is the soon returning, conquering, ruling, reigning, supreme authority, ultimate controller of the universe, king of kings, and lord of lords. And he is not just fooling around when he tells us, don't just say, Lord, Lord, and then do whatever you want. Because if you're a Christian, your life doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs to him. Now, why is it so hard for us to fully surrender to Jesus our Lord? Let's look at a scripture that you're probably all familiar with. It's Proverbs 3, 5, very well-known verse. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, but in all our ways submit to him, and he will make our paths straight. The word submit actually doesn't fully capture the full meaning of this passage. Let me show you why. In the Hebrew language, the word that's translated submit is the word yada. The meaning of yada is actually to know. In fact, it is the same word that was used when Adam and Eve knew each other at the beginning of the Old Testament. It's the word for an intimate relationship of knowing each other deeply and fully. And so this verse, Proverbs, would better be translated, in all your ways, know him closely, know him intimately, and he will make your path straight. And you see, the reason that many of us don't surrender fully in some area of our lives to the Lordship of Christ is because we don't know him closely. We don't know him intimately in that area of our lives. To really know him is to love him. To know him is to trust him. To know him is to surrender to him. When you know him closely, you know that he is ever-present, that he is all-knowing and all-powerful, that he is good in every way. And to know him is to surrender to him because you know that he is the reigning, ruling, supreme king. But at the same time, you know also that he is a relational God who even calls himself Emmanuel, God with us, because he wanted to reveal himself to us. In fact, that's the reason he sent Jesus as a baby in a manger, so that we can see him, so we can know him, so we can relate to him, so we can have a love relationship with him. It's all about relationship. And in fact, when somebody asked Jesus, what's the most important command? What did he tell him? It was about relationship. He said the most important command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. It's about relationship. And it's a fully committed life. It's not a partially surrendered, pick and choose. You know, I like this, but don't like that so much. And No, I must surrender completely, but I do it in a relationship of love. Because I know him so closely, so intimately, and I love him. The tragedy is, there's so many people that are 
under a an illusion that, you know, oh, things are cool with me and God because, you know, I joined the church a few years ago and, and, or, you know, I, I got baptized or I walked forward to the altar and I said this prayer and, and so, you know, we're good. I, I checked the box. I'm in. I'm good to go. No. The reality is that is not what Christianity is all about. The gift of eternal life may not cost me anything. But my only reasonable response to it is to give my whole life. And if I am not giving my whole life, at some point I have to ask myself the question, do I really know Jesus? Do I really know him at all? Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, what? There's our phrase again, Lord, Lord. Oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus is my Lord. I even got a bumper sticker on my car. Jesus is Lord. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So Jesus says, many people are going to tell me, hey, Lord, Lord. Now, by calling him Lord, there is no doubt. These are church people. These are religious folks, right? They're saying, Jesus, I believe you're my Lord. I believe you're Lord. I believe all the, the right doctrines. Not only that, by saying, Lord, Lord, it communicates emotional intensity. Whenever you see in the Bible a name repeated twice, it always communicates an extra level of emotional intensity. For example, King David, when his son Absalom dies, he says, oh, Absalom, Absalom, you know, I wish I could have died instead of you. Or Jesus on the cross, my father, my God, my God, why have you for, forsaken me? You know, it's this extra emotional intensity when you see the name twice. So in Jesus' teaching here, these people are saying, Lord, Lord. It's showing there's real emotion they're behind their words. They're intense. They're zealous about Jesus. Maybe they would even say, you know, Lord, Lord, I, I fed the poor in your name. I led small groups. You know, it, it says here, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name, drive out demons. In your name, perform many miracles. Hey, Jesus, look at all the religious stuff that I did for you. And then Jesus turns to him and says, I never knew you. Wow. That's kind of shocking, isn't it? It's kind of scary to hear that. It's not like he says, well, I used to know you, but then you fell away, you, know, you rotten backslider, you know. No, he doesn't say that. He says, I never knew you. There's never been a spiritual connection. There's never been a personal relationship between us. Despite all of your religious activity, you're a tree with bad fruit. Those are kind of shocking words to us, aren't they? Jesus is saying, despite all your talk, calling me Lord, Lord, we're not in a relationship. You gave me lip service, but not life service. We didn't know each other. There's no intimacy. Why? Because you called me Lord, and you didn't do what I said. Your life doesn't reflect my commands. I'd like the worship band to come up. And as they come up, I hope you can see that there is a big difference between calling Jesus Lord and surrendering to his lordship. Big difference. He is not a part-time Lord, and he doesn't want part-time followers. He gave us the free gift of eternal life, and the only reasonable response to that is Hey, God, here is my life back. Whatever you want, not my will, but your will be done. God, I take whatever I've been trying to control and I surrender it to your lordship. I'm going to get to know you better and better and better each day. And I'm going to trust you with my whole heart. I'm going to lean not on my own understanding in all my ways. I'm going to seek to know you intimately better every day. And you will make my paths straight. Let's stand together for prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray today that you would speak to us powerfully.
powerfully that there would be lives and relationships and families and marriages that are transformed as we surrender to your lordship. Some of you listening right now might say, yes, I I really do want to live the fully surrendered life, but I know I have an area that's only partially surrendered. Why don't you just offer that up to God right now as we pray? And God, I surrender that area to you right now. I confess that I've been partially surrendered in this area, but I don't want to be. I want to be fully surrendered to you. And so by faith, God, I give this area to you right now. (coughs) Others of you here may recognize that while maybe you've been around church for a while, you recognize that you really don't know God as closely as you should. You don't have a growing relationship with him, but you want to. And so you can just pray with me. Jesus, I want to surrender to you. I want to know you more and more closely and intimately each day. Would you transform me? Would you fill me with your spirit? Would you help me to surrender every area of my life to you starting today? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Giving you my heart All that is within Lay it all down For the sake of you, my King Giving you my dreams Laying down my rights Giving up my pride Full of promise of you
close by our side and hold us close to yours. Lord, I pray that this week would be a week where, where we see those moments where we can make you Lord in our lives, follow you as Lord in our lives. Work on our hearts, God. Wake us up where we've been asleep. Open those places where we've been closed, Lord. We want to hear your voice and follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We have prayer teams over here to your left. Uh, we've got a, as a second Sunday of the month, we have a prophetic prayer team, which is somebody that listens to see if the Holy Spirit has something he might want to say to your life. And uh, you can take that and, and uh, you know, pray about it and see if God confirms that on your end. And uh, it could be a great way to hear encouragement from God. And I encourage you to uh, take a moment with them and, and just spend some time in prayer. Invite the Holy Spirit's presence into whatever might be happening in your life. Let's surrender. Let's let him be Lord. Do his job and we'll do ours. The rest of you have a wonderful, blessed week. Celebrate Jesus a lot this week. Amen.